I know many people here don't care that much about sports, but uh, I, every March there's a national championship and um, the, the, a lot of people are there. There's 30,000 people there and you know, a million people watching on TV or something. Well, one of the guys that won, um, he, he won his third one in a row and the max you can win is four. So that's like a really big accomplishment. There's only four people to ever do that in all of NCAA history. Well, he stands up um, and they're interviewing him on live TV and the guy said something like, uh, so what uh, brings you to win? Or I don't know what he said, but most, most athletes are just like, well, glory to God, you know, my teammates played well and whatever. And this guy was like, well, power be to Jesus Christ. Um, through him, you can receive salvation alone. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit, not through his life only, but his death, burial, and resurrection. There's no false prophets like Muhammad that you should listen to. Praise be to Jesus. Literally like word for word. And I was like, whoa, he literally just like went through the gospel and the guy was like, just completely ignored his question. He was like, okay, so what about your power and finesse? And he's like, well, I received my power through the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. My power is through the Holy Ghost. And the guy just like didn't know what to say, the reporter. So I was watching that, just like, wow, I've never seen somebody so boldly proclaim the gospel. Of course, this morning people are like all up in the ends about it because he basically called out Muslims and said Muhammad was a false prophet and other things. So I should share that with you guys because I showed Alon and I was just like, wow, this is a powerful thing that this guy just said. Uh, it was really cool. Anyway, Joshua chapter 9, the title of my sermon is really powerful. The title is just Joshua 9. So it took me a long time to think of that. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. Uh, I'm bringing this down to the six different parts. So for people that like to take notes, um, the six different parts are number one is God's power. Number two is men's weakness. Number three is works impress men. Number four is God's foolishness is greater than man's wisdom. Number five is keep your oaths, and number six is all things work together uh, for those that love God. So uh, let's dig into uh, Joshua 9. We're just going to work our way through the chapter here, kind of dissect what it says, and uh, we'll start with verse 1 and 2. It says, And it came to pass, when all the kings which were on this side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. So this shouldn't come as a surprise, because at this time in the book of Joshua, for those that are following along, Joshua and the nation of Israel had already destroyed Jericho. They had already defeated Ai in like a miraculous fashion. I mean, God's up there playing chess and everybody else was playing checkers. They literally just like wooed Ai out of AI, for those of you that read it. And then the rest of Israel comes down and just burns AI. So all the people that are in, that are supposed to be dwelling in AI, they just don't have a home to return to. It's like hilarious if you actually read the passage. And uh, it's cool to see how God is so much smarter than men are. He knew exactly what they would do, and he just wipes out them as a city. And the kings on the east side of the Jordan had a very good reason to be afraid of Israel, but not only because of what had happened on the east side of Jordan, but also take a look at Rahab's testimony in Joshua chapter 2 as to what people were thinking when Israel uh, came over and, and uh, crossed the river. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 and 11, it says, um, And she said unto them, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you for we have heard how the lord dried up the water of the red sea for you when you came out of egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the amorites that were on the other side sorry jordan sihon and og whom ye utterly destroyed so when i'm reading this i'm thinking it's interesting that winning the battle with the amorites is right up there with the drying of the red sea so i wanted to um, kind of diagnose why that was as big of a miracle according to these people and why it made their knees tremble is what the Bible says and what the issue was. So who are the Amorites? I want to address this very quickly. And this is the part that kind of speaks for God's power. It speaks why Israel what, or why uh, the kings at this time were afraid of Israel. So flip with me, if you will, to Numbers chapter 13. And we'll go through of what the Bible says on who the Amorites are and why it, was, it brought such great terror to the land of Canaan, and uh, why they wanted to kind of gang up against the nation of Israel. Numbers chapter 13, verse 28. 
It says, nevertheless, the people be str- Now, this is, uh, just so you know, this is, uh, the, the scouts went into uh, the land to see if it was inhabitable for Israel. And this is their report coming back to Israel um, as to what they saw whenever they went in. So verse 28 says, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil rapport, which means at this time a lie or a fib or whatever it may be, of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land, though which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So there's some embellishment of the truth here, and we don't know to what degree their embellishment. Obviously, this is because they came with an evil rapport. It's not actually as grasshoppers before their sight, but it does seem like they're very tall and very large men when we read the rest of the context. Flip with me, if you will, um, to Deuteronomy chapter 3. After they had just got done slaying these same men, look at how it describes uh, their king. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11 says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. So assuming we're not exaggerating here, nine cubits is 13 and a half feet long. And a king-sized mattress that you could get in the United States, to put into perspective, is six and a half feet long. So according to, if you were just to do a direct measurement there, it's over twice the size of a king-sized mattress. And the sons of Anak were Anakims, who were very large people, some of which ended up in the city of Gath. Uh, Joshua 11.22 says, There was none of the Amakins left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, there remained. And then later on in Joshua 12, 24, it says, And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Adri. And so these are clearly very large humans, men of great stature, that I think at least resembled what Goliath was in 1 Samuel, because he is a descendant of where this lineage would have been. And then lastly, in Amos chapter 2, verse 9, when God is kind of upset with Judah and he's upset with Israel, and he's talking about all the things he's done for them. One of the things he mentioned is, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So the point is that people... Uh, like to embellish the truth here. They like to say that uh, these uh, men were a certain size. It doesn't really matter what size the men were. I think that's a really silly argument to get into one way or another. But they were obviously men of great stature, is what the Bible calls them. So it, the whole land feared the Amorites, and Israel just wiped them out. And it wasn't by Israel's own volition. It was God basically instructing them the entire way and showing them how they can wipe out the Amorites. So the perspective of Israel coming into the land is like, wow, these guys have done some miraculous things. We need to not mess with them. Let's all gang up and kind of go against the the nation of Israel. And so this is why there was great fear among all the land and the kings of the time, because Israel's God, which is our God, had dried up the Red Sea, had already defeated Ai, they had already defeated Jericho, they had already defeated the Amorites, etc. And they're just kind of on a roll. Israel's just like following God's every command. And so far, things are going awesome. So that's a testament to God's power in Joshua 1 through 2. And then in Joshua, uh, or Joshua 9, 1 through 2. And then in Joshua 9, verses 3 through 6. Let's flip back to Joshua. This one is men's weakness. And men's weakness throughout the majority of the Old Testament, or one of their main weaknesses, I would say, is deception. We fall for deception over and over and over again. And I'll explain why that happens as we progress through the passage here. 
But Joshua 3 through 6, Joshua 9, 3 through 6, it says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wildly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provisions was dry and moldly. And they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gigal, and said unto him, And to the men of Israel, we, become, we come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. So all we have known so far, all Israel has known so far to this point, is people denying God and proclaiming war on them. So from just a carnal perspective, from a man's perspective, it has to be some degree of relief that somebody's like, your God's awesome, you know, we're come here to serve you. Because this entire time, they just had animosity, and they've had battle after battle, and they haven't experienced any type of, even if it's fake, generosity yet. So from the leader's perspective, it's like, wow, okay, this is a little something new. Maybe we will be expected. Now, the problem with making peace with Gibeon is it goes directly against Deuteronomy chapter 7. So flip with me if you will. We're going to flip quite a few places today, so I apologize if your hands get tired, but you'll live. Deuteronomy chapter 7. So Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 9, um, God makes a very clear commandment here. It says, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, which that part I think is already cool. God's like telling them up front, you're not the greatest nation, just letting you know. And so you just kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. And verse 2 says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But this shall ye deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest of all people. So I want to take note there that the commandment is for them to just not make a covenant with anybody. It's to destroy anybody that comes in their path. And that might seem like a harsh commandment. Like, God, why would you tell them to just lay out everybody? Uh, well, the answer is pretty clear. In Exodus chapter 23, there's a reason why God didn't want them to have fellowship with anybody. You don't have to flip there if you don't want. In Exodus 23, verse 23 and 24, it says... For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do not after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and, quit break down, or, and quite break down their images. So the only way to totally break down something's images is to break them, is to get rid of them. And, and, and that might mean in this case we'll get into um, the Gibeonites kind of adapting to Israel's ideology, but God's purpose was you're, you're not going to have anything to do with it. You're completely cutting everybody off because it's going to infiltrate and it's going to, you're already pure, the nation of Israel. You already got purified in the wilderness for 40 years. And so we don't want any more uh, animosity or anything against God um, inside of Israel. So that was the purpose as to why they wanted to break down their images and completely annihilate everybody is because God didn't want that creeping in inside of the, the children of Israel. So that was the second point is man's weakness. The third point is works impress men. Okay, let's read uh, Joshua 9, verse 7 through 13. Joshua 9, verse 7. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country, 
Thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took for our provisions out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry, and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. So notice when the Gibeonites are trying to impress Israel, the best thing they could come up with to save themselves is just all of these things that they did for Israel. We brought this wine. We traveled a long journey. We brought this old bread with us. Whatever it may be, they're trying to save their country, and they can't think of anything but than just to bring up all these works that they did for Israel. Now, it's multi-purpose as to why the Gibeonites are doing this. One of them is so that they can make Israel think that they came from a far country, and then the other one is to seduce them into thinking that they are their servants. Because they tell Israel a couple times, we are your servants, you know, we want to serve you, whatever it may be. So it makes Israel think that they weren't Canaanites and to let them know what good servants they could be. Now, you could also make a case here that because works impress men, which is a fact, every man wants to see the fruit of your labor, that that's why we as Christians should be living a fruitful life. That's, that's what James means in the book of James when it says faith without works is dead. If, if I were to uh, be living an unfruitful life, let's say I was going out on my job and I was slandering my wife consistently and I was really rude to my kids and I was drinking on the weekends consistently and just a bunch of vulgar stuff was coming out of my mouth and I was bitter at life and things of that nature. And then I tried sharing the gospel with somebody who's around me all the time. Would there be power and authority in what I'm sharing to them? Or would they be like, is that what the gospel does to people? Is it turns into a bitter man or somebody who uh, lives a life that's unpleasing to most people? Whereas if you're striving to live by the commandments and live by God's glory, the effect you have on people is significantly greater because it's God's reflection on them. It's not because you're doing anything magnificent or you are uh, earning God's approval or you're earning salvation. It's because they see that that's, that's what God does to you is he transforms your heart. And it opens up them for a, a, a conversation about the gospel significantly easier. So that's an encouragement that because men are uh, infatuated with works, that we should live a life that's pleasing to God because that's going to eventually win them over. And Paul talks about that a couple times. Is like basically he's proved his worth before the church and things like that. So uh, have your testimony straight before people, and it's much easier to share the gospel with them. So uh, works impress men, but that doesn't explain why Joshua was fooled by this, why the Israelites uh, didn't come to the conclusion that Gibeon was trying to fool them. So what is the purpose? How, how did that take place? And that's Joshua fourteen fifteen. It's God's foolishness is greater than man's wisdom. So Joshua 9, verse 14 says, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So take things to God. I mean, that would have solved any issue. And that's what Israel had been doing before this chapter is they were taking things to the Lord. Now, one of the best examples I can think of, um, and my favorite part of this story is in the book of Daniel. Uh, so turn to Daniel with me, if you will. And Daniel is a great example of somebody who just takes almost everything to the Lord. And I'll give you, I'll kind of explain what I mean here. Daniel chapter one. Verse 8. Okay, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, the part I want to focus on right here as to how you can be always asking the counsel of God is to purpose in your heart to do so. And this characteristic stays with Daniel all the way through uh, in Daniel and the lion's den, which is like one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament. But a part that many people skip over is after Daniel finds out about the decree where Darius's men go in and they 
uh, basically say anybody that asks anything of God um, or any other God other than Darius, they shall be cast into lion's den. Daniel's response here is like kind of baffling. Look at Daniel 6 verse 10. So he knows the punishment here. He knows that if he disobeys the decree, then he's going to be cast into the den of lions. And Daniel's response is, is almost exactly opposite of what Israel did in Joshua chapter 9. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he knows the decree is there, he's totally aware of what's to happen, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He was already doing it. He wasn't doing it to because he was out of great distress and he needed to go to the Lord because uh, he didn't know what to do. He was just keeping up with what his everyday life was. Daniel's everyday life was to get on his knees and pray three times a day. Didn't care who saw it. So it, that's how you kind of combat different tribulation. That's how you are able to withstand the darts of the devil, as Ephesians 6 talks about, is to already be serving the Lord. If you're already serving the Lord, then through trials and temptations, it's significantly easier just to hear God's voice. Whereas many Christians just turn to God during the trials and tribulations, in which case it's really difficult to open your heart towards what the Lord has to say because you don't know what submission looks like in the first place. Whereas if you're constantly submitting, if you're constantly going to church, if you're constantly on your knees praying before the Lord, if you're constantly reading the Bible, then you have a heart that is willing to please the Lord. And that's why, and a lot of I've had this conversation a lot, that's why to me going soul winning isn't just something I think every Christian should be doing. But to me, it's a submission issue. The Bible says, him that knoweth do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so I had a conversation with this lady uh, a couple weeks ago at, at a park, and we just ended up kind of getting into the gospel. And uh, she asked me like a couple questions. She was, and then she said something like, um, so do you just start every conversation like this? I don't remember what she said. Uh, you can ask Alana after. Alana would probably remember. And um, I was like, well, no, not every conversation. We try to, you know, because uh, I told her we go door to door as a church. I was invited to church. I said, we try to kind of work our way into it and let people know we love them. But let me ask you something. I'll ask, I'll return your question with a question, a little harder one. When is the last person you shared the gospel with? And she was like, oh, I, uh, last weekend? I felt like she was lying to me, but off the top of her head, that's a more important question is to who are you sharing the gospel with? You know, at first it might come off. Um, it's a little scary to share the gospel with a stranger in the beginning knocking on people's doors and a lot of people get frustrated and things of that nature that's fine the the greater question is are you sharing the gospel with people you will perfect your tendency to do so you'll get better and better at sharing the gospel people will feel more and more welcome etc but everybody's going to stand before god someday even believers now it's not going to be the great white throne judgment where he's deciding if you're going to hell and and you know judging you by your works but you're still going to have to give an attestment on the judgment seat of christ as to what your works look like as a believer and so the question is, how many people have you led to the Lord? Uh, you know, is your fruit, is it bearing righteousness? Uh, and it's not just the number of how many. Obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, some being just if you've lived a holy life. And not everybody's, if, if you've lived a holy life, the majority of your life, not everybody's going to have the same amount of people led to the Lord anyway. But both people might equally please God. But you should still have a desire to go and share the gospel and to live a life that's pleasing for the Lord. And the way you do that is just to set your schedule that you're going to pray and you're going to uh, be in the Bible and you're going to be out soul winning even when things are going well, even when there's no tribulation, which can be a really hard concept for some people to grasp. So that's God's foolishness is greater than man's wisdom. And the Bible says he that winneth souls is wise. Well, I think a lot of the reason for that is because you really begin to understand the Bible more and more at the more people you proclaim the gospel to because all different kinds of people are going to have all these different objections about what the Bible says and does it actually say this and is it the authority? And I mean, you guys know the questions that we get from people at the door. It really refines your faith and it helps you to give an answer of the reason that of the hope that is in you. Um, and it makes it easier to articulate with more and more people as time goes on. So I'm thankful for God's wisdom in that area. And we should be out getting people saved because it changes our heart and hopefully it gets other people saved as well. So that's the, the, uh, the fourth point is that God's wisdom is greater than man's foolishness. Let's stick with God's wisdom and ask him in times of need and when things are going well. Now, Joshua 9, 16 through 20 is keep your oaths. This is an important concept. And I want you guys to see the twofold 
um, kind of implication that's in Joshua 16 through 20. And I'll explain that here in a second, but I'm going to read it first. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them. And the children of Israel journeyed and came into their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Shepherah and Beeroth and kerjath Jerim. Austin, thanks for teaching me how to pronounce that, man, when you were reading this the first time. <laughs> and the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation murmured against the princes. But all the princes said to the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swear unto them. This is interesting. Israel basically returns the favor to Gibeon that God had given to them multiple times. It, God keeps his oath towards Israel when Israel doesn't deserve it over and over again. In fact, when you read uh, the entire Genesis through like the book of Psalms, it becomes kind of a headache to read because Israel just disobeys God over and over and over and over again and breaks this covenant that they have with God over and over and over again. And instead, God just keeps the oath which he gave unto them. So an example, this is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. It says, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So there are actually two oaths being unjustifiably kept here. Like it would be totally fine, in my opinion, if Israel just like turned on the Gibeonites because their oath was based on a lie. But God doesn't do that to Israel. And so it makes them not a hypocrite and it reflects God's glory that they're keeping their original oath the oath that they swore by God because of the fact that God promised Abraham that uh, he would bless his seed and they would go into a land of promise. And so uh, in keeping that promise, in keeping that oath, Israel reflects how great God is by keeping the oath that he made toward Israel. The last one in uh, Joshua 21 to, to 27, the point I want to make is all things uh, work together for good to them that love God. That's Romans 8, 28. So Gibeon's perspective this entire time has been that they would be Israel's servants. Verse 8 says, we are thy servants. And then uh, let's go ahead and read 21 through 27 so I can explain this a little better. But I have to flip there, so give me a second. All right. Joshua 9, 21 yeah, through 27. And the princes said unto them, let them live, but let them be hearers of wood and drawers of water, unto the congregation, as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you when ye dwell among us. Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servants, Moses, to give you all the land, and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Therefore were we so, so afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now behold, we are in thine hand, as it seemeth good and right unto thee, do unto us. Do unto us do. And so did he unto them, and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, that they slew them not. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even to this day in the place which he should choose. So the kings at the beginning of the chapter didn't believe that the Lord thy God could just wipe out everyone. But Gibeon did believe that of Israel. And so they were trying to, even if it was a mischievous plot to seduce Israel, they were trying to save their lives, the Bible says right here. And so it was evil what they originally did, but they were lost and they were sinners. And I believe the children of Gibeon, this is my own personal belief, by the way, I believe that they ended up getting saved and I'll explain why here. The first reason is because of Joshua 10, 1 through 8. So the very next chapter, um, the same kings that gathered 
in chapter 9 to slew, to, to, to basically destroy Israel, also gathered to destroy Gibeon after they find out what's happened. So in ch- chapter 10, verse 1 through 8, it says, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he hath done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore... Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hohim, king of Hebron, and unto Phiram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, Lachish, and unto the Debur, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. They made all their hosts and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. And so Joshua, honoring his original promise, ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And look at, now God hasn't spoke in, in Joshua chapter 9 this, this whole time. So finally, God kind of gives his insight on the situation, and God says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. So Joshua, or G- God thinks Joshua is just in going and defending the Gibeonites. So not only is God in support of Joshua going in and defending the Gibeonites, but the second reason I believe that Gibeon uh, got saved is because they become a priestly city. And the Ark of the Covenant resides in Gibeon. In 1 Chronicles 16, uh, verse 39 and 40, it says, And Zadok the priest and his brethren the priests, before the tabernacle of the Lord, in the high place that was at Gibeon, to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord upon the altar of the burnt offering, continually morning and evening, and to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord which he commanded. So the Ark of the Covenant do- doesn't just reside in places that aren't holy, according to the uh, Old Testament. So the Ark of the Covenant is at Gibeon, and Joshua goes and defends Gibeon, and God supports them. And then the third reason is because at least one of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite. Whenever David like uh, gets cast out, and then remember the mighty men come and support David. In 1 Chronicles 12, 4, it says, And Ismaiah the Gibeonite, a mighty man among the thirty, and over the thirty, and Jeremiah, Jehaziel, and Jehoanan, and Je- Josabad, the Gedarethite. So one of the mighty men of David's is a Gibeonite, and, and traditionally the mighty men that were with, uh, who would become King David at the time, would have been Israelites or people that shared the same values as him. The fourth reason, and there's six reasons total, is because God appears to Solomon in Gibeon. And notice the context here in 1, Corinthians, or in 1 Kings 3, 4 through 5, it says, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, For that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar in Gibeon. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. So Solomon makes it a huge tradition to go to Gibeon to make burnt offerings, to make sacrifices. The Bible says he does it a thousand times, which means because the tabernacle is already there, as we just talked about, um, and because Solomon goes in and, and because God is uh, basically in agreement with Joshua with defending the Gibeonites um, and a few other reasons, uh, like reason number five here, the fifth is because the Gibeonites were among those who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 3, 7, it says, And next unto them repaired Malatia the Gibeonite and Jadon the Merathonite, the men of Gibeon. So the, the Gibeonites are there to help repair the wall of Jerusalem. And I'll get why it's important that the Gibeonites were saved or not saved here in a second. But the sixth reason is because God sends a famine to Israel for breaking their covenant with Gibeon. So go to 2 Samuel 21. And then I'll wrap it up here. Second Samuel 21, verse 1. It says... Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. 
And so the king then calls the Gibeonites up and he's like, how can we make amends with thee? And the Gibeonites basically say, we need seven of Saul's sons. And we're going to, what they say is, we're going to sacrifice them before the Lord. And it uses the Lord, the same Lord that the king of Israel would use at the time. And God gives the blessing and he sends up seven of Saul's sons. And because Saul slew the Gibeonites, uh, the Gibeons are able to reconcile that and slay seven of Saul's sons. And then all is good between Israel and, and the Gibeonites. So I believe that uh, Gibeon repented of their old ways. And the reason that has a lot of implication is because if Gibeon repented of their old ways and got saved, then there's an entire sermon based off the idea of dispensationalism as to where the seed of, of Israel is what's important, being a physical seed. And there wasn't a mixing of different genealogies and different nationalities back then. Because people that believe in dispensationalism, which I don't know who's familiar with it here and who isn't, believe that the blood of Israel is a special people and that they are God's chosen people. And then we are kind of like outside of the remnant of God's chosen people. And so that has a lot of implications as to how that couldn't be true if Gibeon did end up getting saved, if the entire nation uh, basically mingled with Israel. But uh, I don't know. That's just my opinion on that matter. So anyway, the six things that I got out of this chapter is God is powerful and the world knows it. Uh, don't be deceived. Works impress men. God's foolishness is man's wisdom. Keep your oaths and all things work together for good to them that love God. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to preach, and thank you for um, your word, and uh, thank you for our congregation, just the desire to uh, go out and get people saved and to serve you. In Jesus' name, pray, amen.